Our sermon passage will be uh, from Luke 2. Luke 2, uh, I will read verses uh, 8 through 21. Luke 2, 8 through 21. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, and among those, among those with whom he is well pleased. And the angel went away with them into heaven, from them into heaven. And the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see the thing that has happened, that the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that they had been told concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherd told them. But Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. This is the word of the Lord. Let us, be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your word. We thank you for this announcement of the angel to the shepherd of the incarnation of your son, that your son has been born, that there is a savior come into the world. And so, Father, we ask this morning, as we consider these great things, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This Advent season, I have been, we have been looking at what I've called the Songs of Advent. That is, we have been looking at the songs that surround the announcement and the birth of Christ in uh, Luke's Gospel. The last two weeks, we have been looking at songs that occurred before the birth of Christ. We began with Mary's magnificent song, where she magnifies the Lord after, uh, after Elizabeth announces to her. She said, why has the mother of my Lord come? And then the next thing we looked at was Zechariah's song of a blessing to God, where after the birth of his son, where, where his tongue is loosed after being silent and mute for nine months, and his, his tongue is loosed, and he, he praises God, not for his child, but he praises God for the, the promised Savior, the promised Christ child that his son will point to. And today we are moving from songs that occur before the birth of Christ to songs that occur after this week we will uh, be looking at the angel song that we see here, this great glory where the angels appear to the shepherds and they sing glory to God in the highest. Next week, the day after Christmas, we will look at the final song in Luke's gospel at, around the birth of Christ where a uh, mysterious man, Simeon, picks up Jesus and sings a song over him in the temple. And our song today... The Gloria that the angels sing is perhaps the greatest Christmas carol ever written. It is inspired by God. It is sung by the angels. It points to a newborn Christ and the glory that he would bring his Father in heaven and the peace that he would bring people on earth. But perhaps if you're perceptive, you might say, well, if I see verse 14, it says the angels were saying. It doesn't tell us that this is a song. Well, this happens in other places in scriptures. If you read through the Psalms, it often says, let the people say, but we know that the Psalms were songs to be sung. And so this is, without doubt, 
a song that was sung. This is what the shepherds experienced was perhaps the greatest Christmas concert of all times. And this song is the basis of some of our great carols. Hark the Herald Angels Sing is a song that basically summarizes or paraphrases the angel's songs. The song calls us to listen to what the angel messenger is saying. It says, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth. God and sinner are now reconciled. When we sing, angels we have heard on high, we are singing the refrain, Gloria in excelsis Deo, which growing up, I had no idea what that meant. I hope you understand what that meant. I asked my boys last night, they had no idea. That is the Latin phrase for glory to God in the highest. When you are singing, Gloria in excelsis Deo, you are singing the angel's song. This week, as I was preparing for this sermon, after I had done some work on it, and I was imagining the angel songs, I turned on perhaps the greatest rendition of this song found in Handel's Messiah. And I turned on that, the song, Glory to God in the Highest, and I closed my eyes and I listened. I won't sing it to you. You should know what it sounds like. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest. And then the bass comes in, and peace on earth. Listen to that song this week, close your eyes, and imagine if somehow the beauty, the majesty of Handel's version is pitiful compared to this angel's concert. This is a wonderful and beautiful song to consider the Sunday before Christmas. It is short, it is concise, but it is beautiful and majestic, and it points to all that Christ would do in such wonderful simplicity. What did Christ come to do? Christ has come first to give glory to his Father in heaven and to give peace to men on earth. But beginning with some context, when we begin at the beginning of the chapter, we see that Luke's story of Christ's birth begins not with Jesus, but it begins with a, another king. It says, in the days a uh, decree went out from Caesar Augustus. This was the man Octavian. We should recognize, if you know your ancient Roman history, if you know your history, this is one of the great human leaders in all of history. He solidified power in Rome. He was the one who began the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. He was the one that, that really put down his enemies and brought good things, humanly speaking, to the Roman Empire. And so this decree went out that all the world would be registered, that there was going to be a census, and uh, Luke tells us that people went back to their ancestral homes in order to be registered for what was probably a tax census, figuring out how many people were in the world and or in the realm and figured out how much tax each person owed. And so Joseph went up. He actually moved south about a three-day's journey across a fairly rough hillside all the way from Nazareth in the north of Israel down to Bethlehem, the city of David, where, where David comes from, the connection to royalty. Bethlehem is the house of bread. It is David's hometown. And it tells us that Joseph was from the line of David. Again, connecting our mind to the fact that David isn't a poor carpenter, but David is from the line of royalty. And Mary went with him. And they were still only betrothed. That is a legal engagement that is unconsummated. But she was pregnant as a virgin. And then it simply tells us some of the, the facts of the birth. It simply, it's, it's amazing sometimes the facts that we want to know. The Bible just simply tells us. We want to know where they were. We want to know how long it took. We, wanna, we want details. And the Bible simply tells us that the time came where she gave birth. She gave birth to the firstborn son. It tells us that they wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Now what these were were kind of like bandages, uh, strips of cloth that you would uh, wrap around a newborn to provide it some warmth and some stability so that they wouldn't be kind of flailing their limbs all over the place. That's the idea of swaddling clothes. You would wrap it tightly around a child to kind of keep them from flailing, keep them protected uh, from themselves. And then it tells us that she laid this child in a manger. Now a manger, you probably know, is an animal feeding trough. 
It was a place where you would put down the feed for the, the animals, the feed for the donkeys or the cows, and it was maybe made of stone, but a uh, uh, wood, but probably uh, in this area of the world, hollowed out from a stone. So it would be a stone lying on the ground, and they would have hollowed out the inside in order to be able to put feed down into it. And so they wrapped up this child uh, protect, to protect him, and they laid him down in this strong stone manger that they were using as a cradle. And our Bible say that there was no room for them in the end. Now just to, uh, uh, we should probably realize that what's going on here is probably not talking about a commercial end. Right? In our minds we have this idea that they went up to the end, the end said, well, there's just too many people here, you can't stay here, we don't have enough room. But this word actually is, a, is the word that just means guest room. It's the same room that in Luke 22, Jesus says, hey, uh, we need to celebrate the Passover, and so you're going to go into town, and you're going to tell a guy, hey, we need your guest room. Right? There's a room that you would have for guests. And so perhaps what's going on here is that Joseph, going back to his hometown, where he actually probably owned some land, that's probably the reason he had to go back, he probably had family members that could have offered him a room, or maybe could have offered him a room, and perhaps the reason there was no room for them is because Joseph shows up with a pregnant Mary before they were properly married. That's possible. What, now, perhaps the, the guest room was already filled with other relatives, but also perhaps they understood the situation that, hey, you guys aren't married, she's pregnant, there is no room for you here in our guest room. Right? They were put out because of Mary's scandalous position, perhaps. In John 1.11, he tells us that Jesus, the Christ, came to his own, and his people did not receive him. Right Now, that is talking about Jesus' whole ministry, that he came to the people of Israel, he came as their Savior, he came as their King, and they ended up crucifying him on a cross. But here we see the beginning of it, that there is no room for him. There is no room for him, there is no room for his family, there is no room for his mother, to, ha to deliver him in any kind of polite society. He has to go out to what is probably a cave where they kept animals, deliver him in the cave, and use a manger for a cradle. And then uh, Luke kind of switches scenes, and he tells us that in that same region, in the region around Bethlehem, there were shepherds, and they were working the night shift. They were keeping watch over all the flocks by night. And we should realize that if these shepherds were out in the field around Bethlehem, this is the same field, the same pastures, where David would probably have shepherded his flocks many centuries earlier. And of course, we all know that shepherds in, in this time were lowly. They were uh, uh, not really part allowed into polite society. They were kind of viewed skeptically. And so they're outside, and this is the people who the angels decide to announce the birth to. And at first, we get one angel, and it is perhaps the angel Gabriel that we've already seen twice, although we're not given. But the story is that into the darkness of their night, they're sitting around in the darkness, keeping watch, looking out for predators, perhaps a little bit on edge, and suddenly the glory of the Lord begins to shine around them. Now we should not mistake what's going on here. Right? Perhaps if you've seen a movie or a cartoon, you might think there's a one little spotlight coming down, but we should realize what God's glory is, especially in the Old Testament. Think about Moses asked to see the glory of God, and God tells him, no one can see my face and live. I'm going to let you see my backside. And even that vision of God's glory changed Moses so that he was shining, that he was radical. When the glory of the Lord came upon the, the tabernacle and came in the temple, the people couldn't stand to look in it. It was so bright, it was so majestic, it was so glorious that they had to avert their eyes. And so imagine that, that you're a shepherd in the middle of the night, peace and quiet, a little bit on edge, and this glory, this glory of God that is so bright it can change people and make them shine, it's so bright that it can uh, make you turn your face away and leave your place. That is the glory that begins to shine all around them. And this angel comes with a message not to fear, which is what we see the angel say again and again. Right? We have seen uh, every time the angel appears, the, 
uh, response is fear, that just supernatural creatures come to see you, and they tell us not to fear. And she said, don't, the angel said, don't fear, for I bring you good news. I bring in you the gospel, the Greek word, I bring in you the evangelion, the word that we get evangelical from, the, the gospel, the good news I have come to bring you. And it is a gospel of great joy, and it is a gospel, it is a good news that will be to all people. And then the angel gives the content of this good news. For unto you, for you, for you shepherds, for everyone that hears this news, for everyone that believes this news, for everyone who hears and believes this news is born this day a Savior. Of course, we know a Savior is someone who rescues, a Savior is someone who can redeem, a Savior is someone who can fight on our side and deliver us. But already in Luke's Gospel, we have seen that it is God who is the Savior. All throughout the Old Testament we see this, that God is the one that saves, that God is the one that delivers. Uh, earlier on in Luke 1, we see that, that they say, My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. So already here, I think the angel is saying that the Savior that is to come is God in the flesh. The, the Savior that is born is God himself. And the Savior is Christ the Lord. Now that word Christ, of course, points to the Messiah, the, the promised one, the one that would fulfill centuries of hope, the one whom God's people were looking for. And he is also Christ the Lord, the Lord being the name that the Israelites used for God himself. So the one is, there is a Savior is born. He is the one that will save us from dangers, from all of our need, from oppressions, from disasters, from enemies, and he will come to give us his full blessings. And he is the Messiah of God, who is also the Lord God himself. What we have here is, is nothing less than an announcement that there is a divine Savior, that God himself is born. And what's interesting uh, about this announcement is that uh, it, it flies in the face of some of the uh, announcements of Caesar himself. A few uh, decades ago, there was a, a archaeological find called the Pyrene uh, Calendar Inscription. And it said basically that Augustus Caesar, that we've already met, is the greatest thing ever born, and so we need to begin to change our calendar around his birth date. And in this uh, inscription, in this announcement, it said that Augustus Caesar is our savior, he is the one who would end wars. No one will ever surpass him. And that the birthday, his birthday, is the beginning of the good news. It is the beginning of the gospel. Now it's amazing that all these things that are promised about Caesar Augustus, that he's a savior, he's going to end all wars, that, he is, that his birthday is the beginning of the gospel, the angel comes and announces and said, this is actually true about Christ. And so understanding that, I think we see the angel's announcement is that God comes in the flesh, which is the true gospel, the true good news that confronts all other gospels. It confronts all other would-be saviors. Caesar saw himself as a savior, and Christ comes as a true savior. And of course, Christ is still the savior. Christ's birth is still the true gospel opposed to all of our false saviors and our false gospels. What are some of our false gospels? Well, we sometimes view the state as savior. Every few years, we, we think that we can find a political savior. Sometimes we view the military as our protector and our savior. Perhaps we think that money is our savior. Many people today think that secularism is our, is our savior. If we can just get rid of different beliefs, if we can just secularize ourselves and have a secularized world, then everything will be perfectly in harmony. In our world today, many people view science as savior. Many different philosophical schools view themselves as the savior of mankind. Different critical theories today offer salvation and peace. And Christ comes and confronts each and every one of these would-be saviors and says, no, 
The only good news, the only gospel that can offer salvation is that God himself has come as very man. And he comes to confront and save us even from our would-be saviors. Some of these things are good things in them in their own place, but as they set themselves up as saviors, as they seek to deliver us, they only lead to slavery. And this is what Christ has come to deliver us from. He has come as Savior to defeat false saviors. And the response of the shepherds is sort of implied. They kind of just know, hey, we're supposed to go find this one. And so the angel tells them how to find them. Well, you'll find them wrapped in twaddling clothes, lying in a manger, just like we already were told that, that Mary did to, Joseph, to Jesus in previous verses. And so, suddenly, after this, with the one angel, there is a host of angels. A large number of angels filled the sky. As I was driving around this week, I found a preacher on the radio who said there were millions upon millions upon millions upon millions upon millions. And I thought maybe, but it is a large number. But we should also realize here that this word host is a term for military. It is an army of angels that come, but this army does not come to wage war against the shepherd, but the army comes to bring glory to God and to saying that they have come in peace, to bring peace to men. And so this song is uh, a song uh, description of what Christ has come to do. And so, what the, and so it describes Christ coming. And what Christ first comes to do, Christ comes to bring glory to God who dwells in the highest. They come to bring glory to God who, who dwells in the heaven. So Christ has come first to bring glory to his God in the highest. To bring glory above, to bring glory to the highest one who dwells in the highest places. Hebrews 1 tells us that the sun is the radiance of God's glory. That he is the, the shining out of God's glory. And he is now born in order that we who receive him may reflect God's glory back to him and glorify him in us. And he has come not only to bring glory to God above, but he has also come to bring peace among, among men on earth. So we bring glory to God on high, bring peace to men on earth. This word peace is, is, is a little bit rounder than our word for peace. Peace, God's blessings, all of God's goodness he has come to bring. Now perhaps the question you're asking at this point, the angels sang this 2,000 years ago, and you might be asking, is this true? Has Christ brought peace on earth? 2,000 years ago, Christ, the angels came to announce Christ's birth with a message that peace is now going to be found among men. Is that true? Think about just our last two years. Think about all the wars that we find ourselves in. We find ourselves in a culture war, a race war, gender war. We have the Russian and Ukrainian war. We have the terrible end of the Afghanistan war. Some people describe our situation as a cold civil war. We have street wars, drug wars, wars of ideas, and you can probably name more. I thought he was coming to bring peace. It seems as if nothing has changed. And often, the temptation is to answer this with a little Christmas sentimentality. The great uh, author Flannery O'Connor said that sentimentality is a distortion in the direction of innocence. So we distort reality and make it look more innocent than it really is. If you've ever read Flannery O'Connor, you know she does not dwell in sentimentality. And that really, what the world is offering at Christmas is that we need to recover innocence. What the world is offering at Christmas is they say, remember what it was like to believe in magic. Remember what it was like to be a child. Remember the peaceful innocence. And so the picture of Jesus peacefully sleeping, surrounding by angels, fits right in with this. Jesus becomes just another peaceful and sentimental reminder that, hey, there, we can try to recover our innocence. 
But the problem is that the darkness of the world laugh at this sentimental peacefulness. Right? When we offer the world sentiment, when we offer the world a reminder of childhood innocence, the world responded that what about the opioid crisis? What about the reality of abortion? What about child abuse? What about cancer? What about job loss? These all laugh at peaceful sentimentality. And so the darkness of our lives, the anxiety, the depression, wickedness, and hidden sins of our heart all laugh as well if our answer is only sentiment. And the church's answer has often been sentiment. Look at the animals, look at the innocent virgin mother, the cute baby, the innocent hillside shepherd, and the feminine angel. This is a nice, attractive picture that points to the innocence of the world. But Jesus has not come to bring sentimental peace. Jesus has not come to bring the peace that we get around Christmas time when we finally wrestle the kids to bed, we can finally get a moment of quiet where we can have a glass of wine, relax, and look at our Christmas tree with Ben Cosby in the background, and that lasts for about 10 minutes before we fall asleep. <laughs> There's not anything wrong with that, but don't confuse it with the true peace that Jesus brings. Because when Jesus comes, he does not come reminding us of innocence in the face of evil, but Jesus comes by facing evil and battling evil through the cross. Jesus comes to bring peace by taking your sins and taking them to the cross and killing them. Jesus brings peace by taking your sins to the grave and burying them. At Christmas, we like to, the, 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 the line that angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch are keeping. But the true peace comes when we recognize that this child, for sinners here, the silent word is pleading, that nails and spears shall pierce him through, that his cross will be born for me and for you. Hail the word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. And so we receive this peace when we recognize that this uh, adopted son of Joseph, who, who was wrapped in the swaddling clothes that was laid in a st stone manger, will one day have his beaten, limp, and dead body being taken down from the cross by another Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. And he would have his body wrapped, not with the swaddling clothes of a baby, but he would have his body wrapped with a linen burial cloth. And that his body would be laid not in a stone manger, but would be laid on a stone slab in a tomb. And so if we want to understand how Christ brings peace, we can never separate Christmas from Good Friday. This child whose birth was announced by these angels would be pierced by nails and a spear thrust in his side. Water and blood would spill out from his side onto the earth. In order to begin changing the world and bringing peace, he must first change the hearts of men where evil and discord and darkness reside. And this is the peace that is offered to men. The peace that comes when the evil in our heart have been hung on the cross with Christ. The peace that comes when the, the darkness in our hearts has, has had the light of Christ shine in them and they are dark no more. This peace cannot come without surrendering our lives to the one who has died for us. Because he has died for us, Christ reconciled, God reconciles himself, granting us his peace, and we then take that peace out and we spread it throughout all the world. And then we are given the response to the Savior. The angels who are singing the song of glory and peace, they suddenly disappear, they go away into heaven, and the shepherds say, let us go to Bethlehem to see this thing that has happened that God has revealed to us. And they go and they find Mary and Joseph and the child, and they make known all that had happened. Now the text seemed to imply that they make it known more to, to more people than Mary and Joseph. Perhaps some other people have gathered around the, the, the cave, or perhaps they went through the neighborhood simply telling people about the angels, telling people about this young child. They, they told it to everyone. And there were three reactions that we are given, uh, beginning in verse 18. All who were told of this news, all who were told about the angels and their announcements and this child, 
They wondered. They had astonishment. Mary had a deeper view of the situation, having uh, already received the uh, angel messenger, already knowing a little bit about what's going on. Mary took these things, and she treasured them in her heart, pondering over them. That means she meditated over them. She prayed over these things. She thought upon these things. In fact, it seems to uh, uh, point that she does this for a long time. Throughout all of her mothering of Jesus, she was treasuring these things and pondering these things. And the shepherd, for their part, they returned, going back to the field, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. And when we look at these reactions, we should see that Luke is also nudging us as how we should react to the story as well. How should you respond to the fact that God has finally come to deliver upon all of his great promises? How should you respond to the news that a Savior has come and that Savior is the Lord God himself? How should you respond to the fact that he is offering you his peace? That he is forming a people whose lives are lived to the glory of God. To the news that he has come to live and die and be raised again. How should you react to the fact that the eternal word of God, who was with God in the beginning and was God himself, took on human flesh and became a man? Well, the first thing you should do with this news is wonder, have astonishment. You should find it amazing. Don't let the incarnation of Jesus Christ become old news. Do not let it become stale. Don't let Christmas become routine. Christ is God in the flesh, and this is a wonderful, astonishing truth. Treasure and ponder these things. John Calvin says, if if we are wise, it will be the main thing that we do in our life, the great object of our life, that we consider all these things with great attention. All these things that God has done in order to build up our faith. So if you're wise, take these things and treasure them and ponder them. And we should glorify and praise God. If the cradle of Christ had such an effect on these men that they went through and they were rejoicing and glorifying God, how much more powerful should the cradle and should the death and the cross and the resurrection of Christ be and raising up our hearts in praise of God? Lift up your heart to God. Let your soul praise him for the great gospel that he has come in his son. As we turn from the Advent season, let your Christmas be filled with wonder, treasuring and pondering these things. Give glory and praise to Christ, and so be filled with the peace of God. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you all thanks and praise. We do glorify and praise you that your son is born, that your son has taken on flesh, that he has gone, that he has done so for us and for our salvation. Father, without your son's incarnation, there is no hope, there is no help. And so, Father, we do praise you that he is willing to empty himself and taking on the form of a man, even the form of a servant. And Father, we do thank you for the incarnation, cross, and resurrection of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.